So Mexico, I, I, I think Mexico is important and it's, um, it's, it's interesting what's going on in Mexico and I think we don't really have a good sense of what's going on in Mexico partially because we're so engaged in our own domestic politics and, and I think Donald Trump has so skewed the discussion about Mexico and about immigration that we don't really have a chance to observe and to read about and to really think about what's actually going on in Mexico. And what's going on in Mexico is super, super scary. Not because of Donald Trump, not because, although Donald Trump, I think, had a big part in causing this scary scenario, but because of what the future might hold in terms of Mexico. Um, as you'll see in a main minute, maybe, maybe we'll end up needing a wall after all. Um, What's going on in Mexico is that they basically elected a Hugo Chavez type person to lead the country. So they've elected a radical leftist, a, a, a self-avowed socialist, but, but really in the model of a Chavez, in the model of a, a real authoritarian and a, a real populist authoritarian, so not as much of a, a dogmatic socialist, a, a committed socialist of particular ideology, but much more of a, uh, of, 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 a, of a populist kind of socialist who is going to really try to control that economy, uh, to redistribute vast amounts of its wealth, to regulate it to death, and potentially to nationalize aspects of it. I mean, the oil company in, in Mexico is already nationalized, but there was a movement towards privatization in Mexico. And uh, that movement is going to be reversed. If anything, there is a tendency now towards uh, nationalization. He is a real demagogue. Um, he is a real, uh, you know, he has all those characteristics of a Chavez. He comes out with uh, his, uh, his monologues every morning uh, with, to, to set the agenda for the media and for everybody else. Of course, he has the intellectuals falling over themselves in, um, in worshiping him. Uh, as, as, as is so often the case all over the world, the intellectuals are very, very leftists, and uh, that, is the case, that is the case as well in Mexico. Um, he, he is establishing his own, if you will, internal security forces that are loyal to him, call it the National Guard, exactly like Chavez did. Uh, kind of a, 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 almost a, a, a militia that is uh, beyond the protection of, uh, beyond the, the, the rule of law to some extent. He is also um, getting the generals, just like Chavez did, very much involved in the economy so that the military has strong economic incentives to sustain the regime. Uh, so anything that's nationalized, anything that is brought into the realm of government, uh, a piece of it will be uh, will be given to the generals and to uh, military commanders to cement their uh, their loyalty. Uh, there is a um, th there is a real there's a real sense that he is going to try to move Mexico uh, in the direction that Chavez moves. Venezuela and now Maduro, and it's interesting how Maduro is still surviving, and we, we, we'll talk about that in a little while, because I don't think anybody expected him to survive. It looked a couple of weeks ago like he was finished, and yet somehow he is still there, which, which just shows you the power and the strength of these, uh, these populist, uh, popular socialist regimes and how they have a hold, because they have a hold in the military, because they provided the military incentives, but they also have a hold on large segments of the population uh, that don't want to see them go. And as a consequence, the, 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 popular, the rebellion against Maduro is just not large enough to really topple him. Not yet, anyway. We'll see as the days progress. Uh, also, what, what's going on in Mexico is interesting because it shows the continued influence of maybe the most evil and most uh, uh, destructive regime in uh, in the in this part of the world in this part of the world in the Western Hemisphere in the Americas and that is the Cuban regime, the Cuban regime and 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 I think the Cuban regime just continues to sustain itself largely because of Obama and and Obama's sanction to Cuba, Obama's visit to Cuba, Obama's uh, you know and the fact that 
Europe has sanctioned Cuba and, and tourism is up. And I won't go to Cuba to a large extent because I will not sanction that regime and not give them the foreign exchange and the money uh, to, to keep doing what they're doing. But uh, Cuba is very, very influential in, uh, in Venezuela. It is the power behind the power. It is the power behind Maduro. It is, uh, it is uh, Cuban military uh, officials. It's Cuban political operatives that are in the field in Venezuela, making sure that the soldiers don't defect, making sure that everything, and these are not conspiracy theories. These are just, this is just fact. Cuba has, you know, Cuba used to benefit enormously from Venezuela when Venezuela had a lot of money from oil. Um, and, but it, you know, Venezuela has always been a regime, the only regime really on a large scale that has supported the Cuba. The only other place in Latin America it was Bolivia, and, and the Cubans have a significant presence in Bolivia as well. They also used to have a significant presence in Brazil. There were 3,000 Cuban, Cuban doctors, doctors, right? Not real doctors, but some doctors and a lot of military police and political operatives that were in Brazil during the leftist regimes of Lula and, uh, and Rossov. And since uh, Bolsonaro came to power, he's kicked the 3,000 out. And it turns out that all 3,000 have gone to Mexico. So Mexico, under, uh, under uh, Obrador, um, the, new pre the new president of Mexico, has a very strong Cuban presence. And this strong Cuban presence is only reinforcing this move towards a Venezuela-like populist dictatorship or populist authoritarianism and a, a, a tilt towards socialism, in the, a significant tilt towards socialism in the Mexican economy. Um, and we'll get to that, because Mexico is not Venezuela, so, so it's, it's, this is far more disastrous and far more scary, but also going to be far more difficult for them to actually implement. But you see, Cuba is behind much of this, and Cuba is hoping to now start getting some revenue from Mexico, because, of course, Mexico has a still functioning oil industry as compared to Venezuela, and uh, the Cuban uh, and, and the Mexican president has promised Cuba significant financial resources in exchange for their help in sustaining his regime in, in keeping it going. So you can see how the, the commies are very good, very good, at asserting and, and inserting themselves into, the re into friendly regimes and making sure that those regimes are successful and making sure that those regimes remain loyal and also making it very, very difficult. Just like in Cuba, we haven't seen a revolution. We haven't really seen one yet in Venezuela and we're unlikely, I think, to see one uh, in Mexico. Now, Mexico, it's gonna be interesting because Mexico, is a large, over 100 million people, 120 million people, large country, a very diversified economy. So it's not like Venezuela that had basically its wealth coming from oil. Mexico has oil, but primarily the source of wealth for Mexico is manufacturing and trade. Mexico is an is a important hub in a globalized uh, trading world. Now granted, that globalization is already threatened by Donald Trump and, and, uh, and his, his tariffs and anti-trade rhetoric, nationalism, rise of nationalism, and, and just a general suspicion of trade. But the Mexican economy thrives on manufacturing and trade, importation. It imports stuff, uh, you know, it imports a lot of stuff from China, uh, takes that stuff and assembles it into stuff that can then be imported into the United States. It assembles things for American companies and brought directly into the United States. It, it is a trading hub with Europe. It is a country whose wealth over the last 20 years has really been built on the idea of low tariffs and on expanded international trade. Now, NAFTA is safe with the, with the new uh, arrangement that Trump has which I don't think he'll get through Congress. But if, if Trump has given up on attacking NAFTA and doing away with NAFTA. NAFTA 2.0 is not NAFTA 2.0, it's NAFTA 1.1. It's minor revisions to the existing NAFTA. So at least Mexico is safe in the sense that NAFTA is still there. NAFTA is a huge boost to its economy, just like NAFTA is a huge, massive boost to the U.S. economy. Trade, after all, is shockingly win-win. 
Um, but, you know, the, 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 the new president, Obado, is definitely anti-trade. So uh, it's other trade policies, whether it's with Asia, whether it's with Europe, whether it's other Latin American countries, are really at risk, are really, uh, are really at risk. So, you know, you could see, and, and the other thing about Mexico that's really, really important, Mexico economy has done very well over the last 20 years, over the last 20 years. Indeed, one of the reasons illegal immigration is way, way down and it is factually way, way down uh, since really 2000. And, and, and Mexican illegal immigration as compared to Ill illegal immigration from other central um, Latin American countries, but Mexican illegal immigration is dramatically down since the year 2000. Uh, and I, I think it's something like 10% of what it was in 2000. You know, again, this is the kind of BS President Trump um, talks about, which is, you know, about illegal immigration from Mexico. It just doesn't exist. Um, or it's, it's dramatically smaller than it used to be. And the reason for that, the main reason for that, is over the last 20 years, the Mexican economy has done well. That is, the Mexican economy is, is, is uh, the, the private sector has created jobs. Um, it, there was a lot of liberalization, nowhere near as much, nowhere near as, as much that is needed. Um, no, way, no way as dramatic as it should be, but enough to really create some real economic dynamism in Mexico, and, and NAFTA helped, of course, and trade with the rest of the world helped, but also liberalization. And actually, in the last administration in Mexico, there was a change to the Constitution to actually bring private enterprise into the oil industry and to bring, for the first time in at least 100 years, I think, back into Mexico found investment into the oil industry. So Mexico was on the rise. Mexico, from an economic perspective, was doing great. Another example of white people don't vote their pocketbook. People vote all kinds of other things, but not their pocketbook. If Mexicans have voted their pocketbook, they would have never voted in Obrador. They would have kept kind of the slightly right of center uh, presidents that, have, that we have seen a string of over the last 20 years, they would have kept those coming because they have actually done enormous good for the Mexican economy. And indeed, so jobs were plentiful. People don't like necessarily to emigrate out, particularly when a country is generally free and when jobs are plentiful and the standard of living is going up, people don't leave. People don't risk the risk of illegally immigrating into the United States if life is decent where they are. So, the whole notion of the whole notion of um, uh, of Mexican illegal immigration is 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 nonsensical over the last thirty years, over the last twenty years. It just hasn't really existed as as any kind of force, um, and and indeed it's been negative. Mex illegal immigration from Mexico since the, since the Great Recession, since two thousand seven has been negative. That is, more Mexicans um, who are here illegally have gone back to Mexico than have emigrated in from Mexico. So generally, the whole hysteria of immigration has been false. However, however, and this is, this is the problem, if Obrador is successful in his economic policies, what you'll see is the Mexican economy tanking. And if the Mexican economy tanks, then you will see a significant, and it might not even have to tank to the extent, to the extent that, um, that it tanks in Venezuela. To see, uh, to see unemployment go up. And if unemployment in Mexico goes up, if the Mexican economy stops producing jobs at the rate it has produced, over the last 20 years, then you will start seeing a rise in people from Mexico trying to enter the United States, and in numbers far, far greater than what we've seen so far, which will only fuel the populist fear-mongering of a Donald Trump or, or whoever follows him as, as the next populist president of the United States. So I think this is the irony here. 
It is Trump, I think, that ultimately made Obrador possible. That is, I think that what led Mexicans to vote for socialist, populist, nationalist is the anti-Hispanic, anti-Mexican, vile language of Donald Trump. It was the unbelievable anti-Mexican rhetoric coming out of the US, culminating with the idea of building a wall and the Mexico paying for the wall, which of course turned out to be one more big unbelievable lie. Um, that fueled Mexican nationalism, that fueled Mexican populism, that fueled Mexican anti-Americanism, and they voted not so much, not so much, for a, um, not so much for a, uh, what do you call it, a socialist president as they did vote for a populist, nationalist, anti-American president who they believed would be much better at standing up against, against Donald Trump. Um, and so Trump brought Obrador to power. Obrador is actually going to tank, likely tank, the Mexican economy, which is actually going to raise, and potentially to, to massive levels, the number of people trying to cross the border illegally from Mexico into the United States, which will then increase the power of populists like Trump, who want to build walls and who want to fearmonger and scare everybody about immigration. 